Praise God. Praise God. Good morning, everybody. It's time for the Word of God. And i like to <laughs> share uh, about the wisdom and the lessons that we can learn from Mary, the mother of uh, Jesus. This morning, the sermon is entitled, uh, Powerful Faith Lessons from Mary. And we are going to begin with uh, God's incredible choice of how come Mary got into uh, the picture and that the story of Christmas, Mary uh, was an, a, a very important uh, person in that story. So God's choice was that Jesus was chosen before the foundation of the world, which means that it was not because of Adam's sin, but that God had already looked into the future. And so God prepared the lamb to be slain even before the foundation of the world. And so Jesus was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the time for you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. So God chose Jesus. And then the next day, John saw Jesus coming uh, towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we know the Christmas story very well, and we know why Jesus came as a baby. And so John the Baptist, he affirmed that this was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the story of Christmas may be important, but let me tell you, the story of Calvary Cross uh, is even more important and the resurrection of Christ. Because without Calvary, we would never be redeemed from our sin. And so let's look at the preparation that God had at that point to bring his son into this world. And so you, you have learned about the 400 years that since the time of Malachi, the last uh, the prophet, to the ministry of John the Baptist, for that 400 years, there were no new uh, word from God or the prophets. They rely on the old words of God. But that did not mean that God was not active. God was still very active during the 400 years leading his uh, people. There were many faithful ones who followed God, but God did not give new words. Yeah, So it's known as the 400 years of silence. It's also known this the inter-testamental uh, uh, period, which means the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was this... Uh, there were these 400 years of silence. And so the Bible tells us in Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5 says, and when the fullness of time had come. So there was a timing that God actually had for the people there to also for that right time to bring forth his son. So God sent forth his son, born of women, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So what was that fullness of time? Let me put it this way. That time Rome had, came, had come into power and Roman uh, empire had spread. And so there wasn't a lot of fighting between the states and the country because now it became like one empire. And so peace was in the region because of the Roman rule and that the people have been speaking Greek. And so Greek at that point would be like the English of this day. And now even when we, uh, when we went to China, uh, people say that, uh, speak to me in English because they want to learn English and they know that uh, English has become an international language. And so people spoke Greek that was a common language. And you, you have heard about the road system built by the Romans. Uh, you know, it was one of the best uh, in the world. And even some of the ancient roads, they still exist 
this day for people to use. And so in the scripture, you'll find that we also learn that the fullness of time also means that the people of destinies were already people like Mary, people like Joseph, people like Zechariah, people like Elizabeth. And then in prophecy, you'll find that uh, Matthew 1, uh, 17 tells you that there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, and 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 to, from the exile to the Christ. And so at that point in history, uh, that God was ready to send his son, Jesus Christ, to live with us. So Luke 1, 26, you know, it began our Christmas story. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a little small town in Galilee, right? To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. So you find that uh, the Bible is very, very clear that Joseph, he was a descendant of David, uh, means that it came from the tribe of Judah. And you find in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, that 500 plus years before the birth of Jesus, that Isaiah, uh, prophet Isaiah actually prophesied and say, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so that what was the sign that uh, the ancient people, they were looking for? They were looking for a virgin to give birth to a son, a special son called Emmanuel. And so in Luke 128, Gabriel went to Mary and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, this is very interesting because of the way he greeted her, you who are highly favored. So is the, you know, that word, uh, kikarito mene, all right? This, this, this word means that you who have been highly graced or graced, yeah? means that the grace of God was upon Mary. And then we learn that only one time this proclamation means highly favored being used in scripture. Now the word favored had been, uh, has been used regularly upon different people. You know, you are favored by God. But highly favored, you find that Mary was the only person in the world and only person in history to receive such a proclamation. How come she was known as highly favored? Mary was blessed with the task of being the mother of Jesus. And why? Not because she asked for it. She didn't even know it. But because God gave it to her. God gave it to her. And then Gabriel ended with saying that the Lord is with you. So Gabriel announced that as a matter of fact. You see, God is intimate with those who trust him. How are we going to have God with us? Is that we have to trust God more than we trust ourselves. We have to trust God more than we trust our loved ones and we, uh, that we trust our government and we trust any things of authority and power around us. All right. Once we learn to trust God absolutely, you find that the more we trust him, the more intimately we come to know him. And that's why in our church, we encourage you to meditate. We encourage you to focus upon Jesus. We encourage you to encounter Jesus. Not so much like knowing a lot of word, you know, knowing the Bible. That's good. But that you got to encounter Jesus in a very personal way. So God is very impressed by our faith and not so much by our feet, means all the great things that we have done. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I want to look back and say, oh, you know, I, I built so many churches or 
I raised so many of the pastors. I, I, I had orphanages and all that. And, and the Holy Spirit will, will tell me, God is not impressed by all those. All those ministry he gave you. But he is more impressed by your present time, your journey of faith at this age. So now you are in your 60s, that how are you going to continue to trust God in spite of your past? Your past, you may have many uh, trophies and victories and all that. But God is saying, how are you going to live your life now and into the future? How are you going to trust him? The next point I want to share is called the apprehension. And so the first point was the preparation. But now the apprehension was why? Because Mary was greatly troubled at his word and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now you realize that if the angel were to come to me and say, oh, Albert, you are greatly favored. You know, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, hallelujah, praise God. You know, I'm going to jump and I'm going to rejoice. <laughs> no, but for Mary, she was greatly troubled. Mary did not shout for joy. In fact, Mary was confused in the New Living uh, Bible. You see, say that she was confused and disturbed. She was greatly troubled, or the word used is petrified, scared to death. Because what's that, you know? Anyway, Mary had never met an angel in her life. And so one day, if you were to get up and an angel appeared in front of you and next to your bed, I think most probably you would be afraid to, yeah? And so she had no idea why she was highly favored. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Mary, you have found favor with God. So what is this? You have found favor with God. I want you to know something here is that God makes his choices based upon certain qualities he sees in the people he chooses. Some people say, oh, you know, God just chose randomly. No, I don't believe that. Because the Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show him, himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Which means that God is always seeking those people who are for him. So when people who ignore the Lord, reject the Lord, had a lot of doubt, you know, or even cursed the Lord, I can assure you, you don't find favor. Even though, you know, the word grace is unmerited favor, but the Lord is looking for a heart that is receptive to his grace. So let's look at a couple here to show you from the scripture. They found favor with God. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. You know, Aaron, the high priest. So these were from the tribe of Levi. Okay, And both of them were righteous. Can you see? Can you see the word righteous in the sight of God? means that God has been watching, watching, watching. And so this couple was righteous in the sight of God. Okay? Observing all the Lord's command and decrees blamelessly. So even during the 400 years of silence, God continued to look for people who were then loyal to him. And I pray that your heart will be loyal to him. Some of you this morning, you said, should I Zoom or should I Zoom? Should I come to church or should I come to church? Should I be involved in worship or not? And then you decided to turn on the, the Zoom. You decided to join in worship. You decided to come in to be a part of the kingdom of God in worship. Then I assure you something is that you have found favor with God. Because God is watching you. And then, of course, to those who just ignore and say, I don't care. Sunday is my day. This is my life. You know, I don't care. 
I assure you, favor is not found in that house. So let me prove to you another portion. First Samuel 16 uh, and verse uh, 7 says that the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. That's about David. That time Samuel was about to annoy David. And Samuel saw another brother. And Samuel talked to the Lord and said, this must be the man. And the Lord said, no. Okay, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but what? But the Lord looks at the heart. Let me ask you, is your heart drawn to the Lord? Is your heart having real faith in God and that it doesn't have a shadow of doubt? It doesn't have that self-focus, self-centeredness, you know, and say, look at me, how spiritual I am, how great I am, how rich I am how beautiful I am, how handsome I am, how strong I am. Now, all of this, we've got to let go and focus upon God. That's why our heart is towards the Lord. There are many gifted people, but not many willing people. As a pastor for 30 years now, I can tell you that, um, that this is very, very, very true. There are people that God has blessed with so much gift, but they would not sacrifice to come to church and to serve. Some of them are tremendous musicians, but they will not play the keyboard or play musical instrument unless they are being paid. They will not sacrifice anything for the Lord. So let me say this way. If you are unwilling, you will not find favor with God, no matter how capable you are, because everything comes from God. If you are willing to make yourself usable for the kingdom of God, then you will find favor with God. And this is the condition of the kingdom of God, is that when you open up your hands to God and that he will release his hand, he will open up his hand of blessing to you. You see, that when you start to serve God's people, that the Lord will serve you. And that's the time when I began healing and command healing for others and minister healing to others, even though I was in chronic pain, then one day the Lord healed me completely. And that's how you find favor with God. All right, let's go to the commission. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus, which means Joshua. All right, Jesus. God, our salvation. And so, you know, Mary, of course, in her Jewish name will be Mariam. And Mary was a very young girl. Understand that she was most probably only like 14 years old. And at that point, that God had already called her. And of course, being a teenager, she had to uh, take on this very uh, heavy task here and she was a little bit confused of course the angel continued he said he will be great and he'll be called the son of the most high so this child would be different yeah different from all other children and the lord will give him the throne of his father david and here in verse 32 says that he would be a king and not only a king, but the king of kings, the king of all kings. And therefore, uh, then this, uh, that he wouldn't be just any king, but that he would take over the throne of his father, David. And you find that Jesus would come back again. And when would he take over the throne of his father, David? It would be in his coming. That during the 1,000 years of reign here on earth here, Jesus will establish the capital in Jerusalem. And in Israel, he will rule the whole world. And the 12 apostles will be uh, helping him. And then all of us who are disciples of Christ will be given commission that there will be different areas on this earth, different parts of the world, that we will be commissioned to rule and to take charge. All right, 
And some of you will be taking care of nations, some of you will be taking care of provinces, uh, or about states, and also maybe in uh, little districts too. And some of you will be mayors. And so all these are part of the plan. So this will be the future. So the Lord will give Jesus the throne of his father, King David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendant forever. His kingdom will never end. And so after the millennium, after the 1,000 years, you will find that Jesus will continue to reign. And that all of us here who are actually spiritual descendants of Abraham, spiritual descendants of Jacob, you'll find that we will be part of that kingdom. And that kingdom would never end. Now, you, you, you heard about the three wise men, yeah? And they were the one who, uh, you know, through the scripture and through their own education and through their own understanding, uh, they knew that a king would be born. And therefore, they brought gifts fit for a, a king. Then they opened their treasures and presented to Jesus with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Okay, And so this tree gave gold would be precious metal. It's a symbol of royalty, which means the kingship of Christ Jesus. And frankincense is incense, actually, a symbol of deity, the divine part, all right? And that Jesus is fully God, and later on, fully man is myrrh. Myrrh is the embalming spice, is a symbol of mortality, which means that he was able to die. That he would become the new Adam, the new federal head, and that he would die for our sin, and then he would be raised again and be our king forever. So these three gifts has a very deep meaning and one day we will be able to explain further. The next point I'd like to share is called the submission. And so Mary said, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a, I'm a virgin. And so I want you to understand that there was another person who responded to Gabriel. Gabriel appeared to Zechariah first. The six months before he appeared to Mary. He appeared to Zechariah. And then he said that you are going to have a baby. And that's John the Baptist. Yeah? And Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were the parents of John the Baptist. And Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now see the response of Gabriel, okay? Gabriel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And then you see what Gabriel did? He said, and now you will be silent, which means you become deaf. You can't hear a thing. And not able to speak, come dumb. Until the day this happened, because why? because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. So when I read this, I say, hey, how come when Mary responded that way and that she was not punished, but here Zechariah responded this way and then he was punished. He was made deaf and dumb. And how we know that he was deaf was that, you know, that when John was being born, you know, uh, his friends and relatives got to show sign language to him and say, what's the name? Then he wrote down John, you see? So he was deaf and he couldn't hear. Let's go a little bit of further about the Greek word here. And you find that the Greek meaning literally means that by what thing shall I know this? In Knox's Bible, he said, by what sign am I to be assured of this? Means I want a sign. I want a proof. Zechariah was asking Gabriel for proof of this coming miracle 
considering the other in impossibility of it. So you see the way he questioned was different. He was questioned in doubt, yeah, in full, full doubt. But Mary question was different. You find it in the Greek, it said, how will this be? All she wanted was to know how would she become pregnant if she didn't know any man? Means that she accept, but she said, how am I going to fulfill the will of God? So Zechariah was wanting a proof, but Mary was wanting to know how. So that's why she was not punished. <laughs> yeah. I want to share with you the different fears that we might have if we receive this information from the angel. But this different fear did not arise in Mary's heart. For example, fear of condemnation. What will the people say? I have not known a man and now I'm pregnant, right? And they live in a small village. And the villagers, they are very close. You know, I used to uh, visit my grandmother in a kampong. My grandmother and grandfather lived in a kampong. And everybody in the kampong knew everybody. Everybody. And the door was not locked. And, and any neighbors can just walk into uh, their house. Yeah. So everybody would know that this girl had become pregnant. So there should be a fear, but she was not concerned. Or fear of rejection, would Joseph, my fiancé, would he reject me? Or fear of uncertainty, what will be my future since I'm going to be condemned, I'm going to be rejected? And then fear of inadequacy, how am I going to handle all these changes? I'm a teenage girl, and then I'm going to be pregnant, I'm going to be a mother, how am I going to handle all this? Fear of insecurity. Who will be there for me if I'm being rejected and I'm being thrown uh, outside out of the village because of my sin? Then who will be there for me even though I have not sinned? You see? But did all this never cross her mind? Fear of difficulty would there be trouble? So you can see Mary was actually a very unique person, a unique woman. Now let's talk about you. Fears that keep you from serving in the kingdom of God or being used by God. What are some of the fears? I notice could be your need for control. You want to control your own life. You do not want God to control your life. The other one is a fear of the unknown. When I got a call of God, yes, there were, there were a lot of unknown stuff in the future. But the Lord say that his word is a lamp unto my feet, which means that it's not a powerful torchlight, but lamp upon onto my feet, which means that this little lantern, they're just able to light around the area around my feet. And so all I need to know is to walk those few steps as he leads me. And so for all these 40 over years as his child, I have been walking step by step, uh, one face step at a time. So there's no need for you to fear the unknown because God is already there. Or the preference, or your preference for the things of this world. That's the carnality, that's the flesh. And then your emphasis on temporal success. Life is only how many years? Like in Cantonese, they say, Yan sang yao keito ko sapni. How many 10 years do we have? I was in my 20s and then suddenly 40 over years just passed by and then you find that I'm now in my 60s. And those of you in your 20s, you just wait and see. One day you'll be like me, okay? It's very fast, very fast. And then your whole purpose is just to be driven by success, success, and not by the things of God. Miss your desire for personal fulfillment rather than God's will, right? The other thing is your fear of change. You know, I'm so used to doing it this way. I'm so used to not serving God. I'm so used to just serving myself and I don't want to change. So these would be the fears that keep you from being used by God. So back to the story of Mary, 
The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So here it tells us that this child would be divinely created. That Holy Spirit would be involved. And the word is that overshadowing is not by force, but the gentle coercion, the gentle presence of the Holy Spirit and that this child would be come, you know, that God will put his son into Mary. So the Holy Spirit was involved in this. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So we know Holy One will be Jesus and that he was known as the Son of God, but also known as the Son of Man because he would come and take our place. He would come and take the place of Adam. Adam failed, but the second Adam came and he did not fail. So the second Adam would also become the last Adam. And let's look at Elizabeth, you know. Uh, at that point here, what happened was that the angel gave Mary a sign because Mary didn't know that Elizabeth was pregnant. Elizabeth lived in the hill country of Judah. But, you know, uh, at that time, there was no phone. At that time, there was no uh, WhatsApp and all that, okay? So uh, Mary didn't know. So the angels give her a sign. They say, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. So you find that the angel didn't give Zechariah a sign, but punish him. But to Mary, the angel gave a sign and said, I want you to know, to confirm it, your, your relative, Elizabeth, would give birth to a child. And now actually she was actually six months pregnant. And then, without any question from Mary, the angel said, for nothing will be impossible with God. Or in the NIV, for no word from God will ever fail. And this would be a good verse to remember, Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, because it tells you something, is that what you think is impossible for God, nothing is impossible. As long as it's meant for the kingdom of God, is you, if you are serving the kingdom of God and it's not for self-centered purposes, you find that a lot of things that you do will be possible because God is in the picture. I always want to make sure that God is in the picture. For example, Faith Line, uh, we dare not launch it even though we receive we received the vision from God years back. It, only in 2006, when the time was right, then we dared to launch because we perpetually listened to God. Okay, We know that nothing is impossible with God as long as God is in the picture. But if we jump ahead of God, then God is not in the picture. Like some people here, you know, they jump ahead of God and then they got themselves into some business that they are not supposed to be in. And then when their business failed, they blame God. But God was never in the picture. Or in a marriage, and you find that, you know, like we had a case whereby this young man came to our church, uh, you know, years ago that this young man came to our church. And his purpose was to find a girlfriend. And he was not really born again. He pretended to be a Christian. And then when he came in, immediately he met one girl and that girl was so enchanted by him. But we warned her because we realized something was wrong with this young man. And she did not listen. And immediately she got herself pregnant out of weblock. Yeah? And then got married. And subsequently, you see that story was like in 19... 84, no, 1985, yeah? And, and so way, way back. And now what happened? 
Now the whole situation is that the man continued to be godless and she continued to be miserable. It's a sad, sad story. So if you want something to be possible in your situation, make sure that God is in the picture. And then you, 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 you just look at this beautiful girl, this Mary, you know, a teenager. And, and, and this part here just touched my heart. And Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow. I told you all those things, all those apprehension did not happen. She simply trusted. She said, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So her desire was to do the will of God. Her willingness was to pay whatever price to fulfill the purpose of God. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself, make yourself a living sacrifice for the purpose of God? And her faith was to throw her life into the hands of God. That let's say, for example, really that the villagers said that she had committed adultery and would stone her to death. She was willing to pay that price because this girl was not an ordinary woman. Now, uh, this girl, I, I tell you, she knew the word of God. She knew the word of God. She knew the Lord. So from fear to joy, Mary recognized that she was not her own, but a handmaiden of the Lord. And Mary was a willing participant in the plan of God. Hallelujah. Are you willing? Mary knew that it was a privilege to be used by God. Do you consider you being used by God a privilege or you think it's a chore? Some people say like that to me, you know, what to do? I got to serve what? You know, if I don't serve, you know, he'll be angry, right? You see, it's like this reluctant to serve. I mean, I, you know, this God is such a tyrant, you know. He forced me to serve. What to do? You see? Different. Different from Mary. Mary is, you know, I'm your servant. In fact, that the word is not just servant, it's slave. I'm your, you know, female slave. I mean, do to me whatever you need to do. And so Mary wanted God's plan to be fulfilled in her life. And Mary was happy <laughs> and when she met Elizabeth, she even sang a song about this privilege. And so she went to visit Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth saw her in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child you will bear. Wow. You see? Right? So the prophecy also came to Elizabeth and she also knew that her, her cousin uh, was going to have a baby. And then she said, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Immediately, the revelation was on to Elizabeth that this would be the Savior, the Lord. And so that Mary was carrying the Messiah and the Messiah that the people of Israel, they were waiting for so many years. And therefore, Elizabeth declared and said, so why am I so favored? Though you are highly favored, but I'm also favored that the mother of my Lord should come to, to see me. Yeah. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Wow, I can tell you, you know, when people want to go for abortion, let me tell you that the baby in the womb is a living person. And the Bible attests to so many times that a fetus is a full baby. And so she, uh, remember at that time, Elizabeth was already six months pregnant. 
And so the baby actually lived for joy. John the Baptist actually was rejoicing because of the Messiah in the womb of Mary. But Mary at that time, you know, of course, baby Jesus was very, very small, still a very, very small fetus. <laughs> then Elizabeth said, blessed is she who has believed. Now she's talking about Mary. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. She knew the faith of this young lady, or this teenage girl, she knew. And so she said, blessed is she who believed, because Mary really believed. And so Mary responded by singing the Magnificat. That's the Latin word for magnifies. My soul magnifies the Lord. So you will find that it, this song, also known as Song of Mary or Canticle of Mary or the old day of the Theotokos. Theotokos, which means Theos, means God. Tokos means bearer, the bearer of God. And you find that it correlates with the song of Hannah. First Samuel chapter 2, if you haven't uh, read about the song of Hannah. Hannah was barren and she asked the Lord for a child. And the Lord gave her Samuel, okay? And then she dedicated Samuel to the Lord. And I want all of you parents to do that. Is learn to dedicate your children to the Lord. It will only be blessing, I tell you. And don't worry that you will lose your child. You won't. If you will dedicate your child to the Lord. And so Mary's song was this way. My soul magnifies the Lord. How can a soul magnify the Lord? How are you going to bring glory to God? Which means to say that from within, that is no longer you who live, but Christ will live in you. And then whatever that you do, whatever that you say will bring glory to God. Make sure that whatever that you say to other people will bring glory to God. Your action, your mood, your attitude. For example, some people say, I don't know why my husband is not a Christian. And I, I can tell you, you know, as a pastor, as I observed the attitude of that woman, of that wife, and I said that most probably if I were to be your husband, I might not even be a Christian because of the nasty way, the, the, the attitude, you know, uh, that is full of aggression, uh, full of anger, and the, the way, you know, put down people with words. So that kind of soul cannot magnify the Lord because of pride, because of pride. Uh, people say something, you know, people uh, say something about their achievement. Quickly, the woman must step in with her own achievement. Oh, that's my achievement. And then uh, drown out the other uh, person's achievement. So by doing that, you find that you do not bring glory to God. My soul magnify the Lord. So what happened was that Mary submitted herself to the plan of God to be the mother of the, of the Messiah. And Hannah also said, my heart exalt in the Lord. So heart and soul and spirit are basically about the same thing. And that people who walk with the Lord always will give thanks to the Lord. And you say, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. And Hannah said, I rejoice in your salvation. Now, I want you to take note of the word Savior, God, my Savior. Now, this tells us something, all right? Who are the people who need a Savior? Let me tell you, who are the people who need a Savior? Sinners, sinners. Because some people say that, oh, Mary, you know, she was born without sin. That's not true. Jesus was born without sin because the father was not a human being and that the bloodline of the father is where the sin, uh, the original sin will be transferred. But since the father, you know, is the spirit of God, then you find that Jesus was born without sin. But for Mary, both parents were human. And therefore, she said, I need God, my savior. Do you see? So some religions said that, oh, you know, uh, 
Mary is exceptional. Not in this case, not according to the Bible. And Hannah said, I rejoice in your salvation. What she was talking about was not just about salvation uh, in the future, but also in the present situation. She was barren. She wanted a child and the Lord saved her by giving her a child. And then he said, for he has regarded, Mary said, for he has regarded the lowly state of his handmaid, uh, hand, uh, his maid servant. And Hannah said, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Now, Mary was a village girl, even though she studied the word of God, but she was still in an unknown place called Nazareth. Yeah. And yet the angel was sent to this very small village and to minister to her and to bring the good news to her. And so Mary was very thankful that the angel didn't say, you have to make a name for yourself first. You have to be highly spiritual first. You have to be this and you have to be that first. And then, no, but that at, she was, wasn't rich. She uh, came from a poor family. But all those conditions, not important. Lowly estate, not important. Because there was a purpose. For behold, hands for all generation will call me blessed. So you find that Mary knew that her position of being highly favored would be the position of being blessed, but not just for this time, but for generation to come. That's why today you find that in the year 2021, we are talking about her. We are not worshiping her. We're not praying to her because she's not God. But we are talking about this woman of faith, this young girl, young girl of faith. Now Hannah said what? Well, he sits them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. See? So it tells us something about Mary was that she had been studying scripture. She knew this Hannah song very well. And in fact, a lot of her, her uh, you know, the stanza and, and, and the lyrics actually came from Psalms and came from uh, the Torah. I don't have the time to match them all. I'll just match only the Hannah song, all right? But you find that it's so important that this woman was so close to God that she wanted to learn more about God. And so, as he said this thing, a woman, now here I, I, I'm going to emphasize on blessed are those who keep God's word here. Means that I'm going to move you to the time of Jesus when he was ministering. And then as Jesus was saying, ministering, a woman in the crowd <coughs> raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nurse." So here the woman was talking about Mary. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said something that will shock you. Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Can you see? Yes, Mary, right? She was, her womb was used to bring forth the son. Her breasts were used to feed baby Jesus. But let me tell you, she was more blessed because she, hear, she heard the word of God and she kept it. All right? And then Jesus was telling the woman and all the people in the crowd, you should be like my mother, not because that she gave birth to me, but because she kept the word, she heard the word and she kept the word. So to all of us now is that when you are the one who keep the word of God, blessed are you. And the word of God says, serve him, serve him. All right. The word of God says, go here, you go here. Go there, you go there. 
you got to be obedient. So Mary's greatest blessing is more than just, you know, giving birth to Jesus. Mary's greatest blessing, right, is that one day her child will save her from her sin. Later on, we are going to hear that song, Mary, Did You Know? All right, Mary, Did You Know? And in one of the stanza, it says that, you know, uh, that the child one day would deliver her. The child that you deliver will one day deliver you. All right. So that is the same blessing that the Lord would give to everybody who believe in Jesus Christ that you will have eternal life. That the Savior will deliver you. Praise be to God. And then you know, Mary, you know, subsequently became a believer and also a disciple of Christ, right? And you find in Acts chapter 1, verse 14 says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer and together with their women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. It tells us that Mary was also, you know, baptized in the Holy Spirit and also began to speak in tongues. And so continue with Mary's song. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And Hannah said, there is none holy like the Lord. So you see the heart of Mary was just God and God alone. Who is mighty has done great things for me. Some of us are like this. No, Lord, you better be thankful to me because I'm doing things for you. No. For Mary, he said, God, I'm thankful that you have done great and mighty things. And Lord, sacred and holy is your name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Listen to the instruction of Mary. Here is a lesson that the mercy of God will be upon those who fear him. People who come to God and say, I don't care. You know, I live my life. And they expect the mercy of God. No, it's not going to happen. Hannah said, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones. So he's talking about the ones who are faithful to the Lord. And then he said, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thought. Hannah said, do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogant. So that you find that when the Pharaoh boasted and the Pharaoh and even all the kings in the past, when they boasted and came against God, what did God do? God scattered them. God destroyed all their pride. And then he has brought down rulers from their throne, but lifted up the humble. And for Hannah, he says, the bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. So the story that when we look back at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, in his foolish pride, you know, he rose against God. God blessed him with everything, but he took it upon himself and said, I earn it myself. And so what was the result? And God made him like a cow. So he fell from grace to grass and began to eat grass. And then he has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Now watch this young girl, teenage girl here, she was declaring a lot of scriptural stuff, all right? She knew the word. She knew the word. A lot of this were re repeated uh, early on in Psalms, you know, in the various books and by the prophets. And so she was just repeating. And Hannah said, those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. Which means to say that, God is looking at those people who are broken, those people who are weak, those people who are poor. If you who are poor, God is watching out for you. God cares for you. Don't say God doesn't care for you. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendant forever, just as he promised our ancestor. So here, Mary look back again at the scripture and say, you know, that it was 
the promise given to Abraham, and then we are the descendants. And now we are receiving the blessing of the promises of God to Abraham, to, to Israel, you know, to Isaac, and to Israel. Yeah. So, so let me conclude by saying that Christ was born. He lived and died. He resurrected and ascended. And he commissioned and empowered. So that's how Christ came. And I pray that uh, next Sunday, we will continue with the Christmas story. And so we will be able to rejoice with the Lord. So John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I pray that you know that God loves you. You are part of this world and that he has given you his begotten son. To those of you, maybe you have heard me the first time or on YouTube, just know that God loves you a lot. You are not forsaken. God is not rejecting you, even if everybody around you rejects you. God loves you. And that all you need to do is that believe in him, receive him as your savior, and you can just say, Lord, forgive me of my wrongdoing. Forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin. I now I want to surrender myself to you. I want you to be my savior. I believe that Jesus came as a baby and that he lived a good life and he died on the cross for me and have taken away my sin. And today, I want to submit my life to him. I want to surrender my life and I will receive his forgiveness in Jesus' name. Now, if you have said that prayer, you are a child of God. As simple as that. It's not by what you do, all right? It is by who come into your life and that God has allowed Jesus Christ to be your savior. He took all your sin away and that has given you a new life. You don't have to wallow in misery anymore, but you can live a victorious life. If you need any help, you can contact us uh, or any of our pastors and leaders, and we'll be able to help you uh, to walk the spiritual journey and to be a true disciple of Christ. So let's recap here the powerful faith lessons from Mary. The preparation that God, in his wisdom, prepared everybody, everything, the environment, the situation, the people of promise, all this, they came at the right time. Then Jesus was born. But the apprehension never happened for Mary. She was doubtful for a short while, but fully surrendered to the commission and then the submission. Praise be to God. I trust that uh, this message will find a place in your heart. And I want you to know that God loves you a lot. 